Can I ask about the Tom Werman situation? Uh huh. So I've interviewed Tom, and of course I've interviewed Don a couple of times. I've interviewed Tom several times, but when I had asked him about what went down on Tooth and Nail about you guys not getting along, he said something about that you guys were chopping up tape and kind of editing things together that he said to make it seem like he's talking crazy shit. Um, but he also said that you and him didn't get along at all, and, and I guess he stopped tape and hit the call back and said something like put some emotion in your solo or something and and that you guys almost came to blows i don't remember something anything like that happening at all i'm not saying it didn't but i don't think so uh i think the way i remember it was is that we just collectively lost faith in him um as a positive creative force and on the record because just what was transpiring every day in the studio. There wasn't really anything that we could see that was, you know, we didn't feel like we were getting anything for our money, quite honestly. Just to, it, it, because he didn't have engineering or, you know, wasn't a musician and didn't have engineering skills. So it was like, it was kind of the Rick Rubin thing, you know, it was like this, it was almost like a stone soup thing, you know, so like the, the creature gets lost in the forest and runs into this other creature and tells them, oh, we can, uh, I can teach you how to make, you know, if we want to survive and eat, I can tell you how we can make soup out of the stone, right? Heat up some hot water and put the stone in there, and then the, the, the creature tells them, you know, well, if we just had an onion, it tastes a little bit better. We don't need it, but if you just get that. So he kept sending him out to get different vegetables, and finally the, the that person did all the work, and the creature just ate for free. So that's what it's called, I call it stone souping, and there's a lot of that in the music business, and we felt that was what was happening with with that situation that there's this guy who's getting paid a lot of money um, and not an engineer, has no engineering skills, no instrumental, doesn't know how to play an instrument. And the song stuff is kind of, I don't know if he's really contributing anything, kind of was repeating himself. So then it seemed to be spending a lot of time just doing other things that were not conducive to being productive. We sort of lost respect for him and ousted him. That wasn't just me, that was all of us. And and he may have, I don't know if we asked him or he felt it was just time to go and he pulled himself out of it. I mean, listen, I'm not saying that there aren't producers. I'm sure there are, I'm absolutely sure that there are producers with this magic quality in some instances that can pull this thing out of the artist that is super essential to their stratospheric success. And record companies um, are enamored with these guys and pay them much more money than the artist ever makes usually to hopefully guarantee the success. And they have this phantom quality. I'm thinking of Rick Rubin. <laughs> yeah, so, but a lot of people like, have said the same thing about Rick, where they've been bothered. Well, I would like to do an experiment. You take you take ten bands. You make Rick Rubin produce ten bands. Five of them succeed. Five of them fail. Then you take a homeless person. You have him produce ten bands. Five of them succeed. Five of them fail. I think that's what the result of that experiment will, will, would be. And if you put a blindfold monkey with a handful of darts in a dark room, and he's going to hit the bullseye eventually. Uh, I attribute that his success to that. I don't know for sure. You know, I'm sure it's about the chemistry with that particular band. You know, this Chili Peppers or Black Sabbath or this or that it did or didn't have chemistry, or that you know, there's all the psychological stuff going on. That we think this guy is a guru. So if we think he is, then it's going to have an effect on us, and we're going to go dig deeper, and we're going to perform better, and all this kind of thing. So you know, it's hard to really put your finger on what is the catalyst for this this inspiration, but. Um, I just think in our case, we were this, just talking about ourselves right now, we were self-contained rock band. We wrote our own stuff. We had a vision of what we wanted to sound like. We had a sound, and which was developing, obviously, but still. And we were, um, we were doing our own compositions. We felt we were getting better at, at writing and writing hooks, and we knew, we knew what we wanted to do. Um, sure, we could use some constructive criticism here and there, but that doesn't mean that we weren't responsible for what we were producing musically in the studio. So what we really needed was an engineer that could translate that. And we had that in Jeff Workman, and we had that later with Michael Wagner, who was not a producer. He was an engineer. He may have called himself a producer, but he wasn't really. He didn't offer any advice about songs or direction or anything. He would just make sure he made it sound good and captured it. That's all we needed. That's who we honored. We we honored those guys that could do that because they were absolutely essential. They were the fifth member of the band. And we would always bother us that 
the Jeff Workmans and, and so forth were, were underpaid in our, and, and underrecognized, in our opinion. Right. Um, no points or anything, right? On records, typically, right, the engineer? They would be hired by the producer, and we would pay that through the producer, and they would get a tiny fraction of what the producer got, plus no points, plus less recognition as far as credits and so forth. And then if something was successful, then the producer would get all the credit. I was like, wait a minute, that's not right. The guy doing all the work that's here early and stays late and isn't getting whatever (laughs) it's actually doing the hard hard work that's translating what we're doing to a record is that guy behind the board that's the guy that i respect and honor and uh so that always bothered me and still does but as far as the songs all being they were all written say on tooth and nail when you go in there's no developing or rewriting going on in the studio all the records are pretty much the only thing that would ha- really happen in the studio is a little nip and tucking. And producers would feel uh, sort of compelled to say something to, to justify their exorbitant fees. So they were like, oh, and everything. The same thing they all did was just, uh, oh, shorten up, you know, your first half of the first verse. And let's get to the chorus quicker and let's shorten this. And it's just common sense stuff that wasn't any real writing or anything. <laughs> it was just silly shit like that that you know oh, this this part goes on a little too long let's, let's cut it in half okay great here's your hundred thousand dollars and that was the same with a lot of these producers that we worked with you know it's just it's just a lot of smoke and mirrors mm-hmm. 